Good afternoon and welcome to uh, this session of our drought management series for your ranch. Um, today we're going to talk about herd management and culling and with us are Dr. Jana Block. She is the Extension Livestock Specialist at the Hedinger Research Extension Center. Uh, we're coming live to you from Hedinger today and so we appreciate um, Jana and the crew here for hosting us. Uh, Dr. Jerry Stucka is our Extension Veterinarian and, and Livestock Stewardship Specialist at NDSU on campus. And then I'm Lisa Peterson, the Extension Livestock Specialist at the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center near Streeter. Please type your questions in the Q&A. Uh, Miranda, Mary, and Kevin will uh, monitor those and um, we will ask all the questions at the end of the session. We are an equal opportunity institution and um, we have made every effort to make this available for all audiences, regardless of race, uh, religion, creed, any of those type of things. So um, with that, our lead off presenter today is Dr. Jana Block, and she's going to talk about um, some nutritional type considerations for uh, during drought. And for some of you watching, I can't see where you're all from, but for some of you watching um, those You've been in drought for maybe a year, and for some of you watching, uh, we're just starting into that. And so we're gonna look at, at the broader view, and then I will follow up and we'll talk about um, if we get to the point that we need to actually uh, cull some cattle, some culling strategies, and then Dr. Stucka will talk about animal health during a drought. So with that, Jana, and thank you for getting our technology going. Okay, so through this whole series and today, we're gonna keep bringing you back to goal setting, writing things down, because we all know that when you're actually in the throes of a drought, it's, it's very difficult to make an objective decision because there's a lot of stress. Um, there's emotional stress, financial stress, every kind of stress we can think of, which we will be addressing next week in the webinar. Um, but what we really want you guys to be able to do is sit back and take a look at things um, ahead of time because that really kind of takes the emotion out of things and helps you make better decisions. In previous sessions, we've talked about making sure that we're not going to have long-term impacts on forage production and rangeland health. So we always wanna keep that in the forefront um, when we're making those, those goals. Um, we know how much effort and time you've put into developing your herd. So we wanna make sure we can hang on to those productive cows if we can. We need to make sure that we're really focused on maintaining health and condition of those cows. And then of course, we have to think about all the, the risks that are facing us um, and trying to maintain that financial health of the operation, um, always a key goal. All right, so when you're thinking about preparing for drought, and we have talked about some of these before, um, again, a lot of this is just writing these things down, even if you think you don't need to, it's really helpful to just have things written down so that you can refer back to that um, when you're trying to make some, some various decisions and you don't have to try to rack your brain for those numbers. So just knowing numbers in your different production groups, whether that's bulls, mature cows, yearling heifers, whatever that happens to be, um, having an understanding of your what your grazing and hay needs are gonna be and what your options are. And then even looking forward into winter feed needs, just assuming that our forage production is gonna be impacted this summer. Um, in terms of infrastructure development, obviously that's gonna be a financial burden. Um, so maybe at this time, that's not the best idea, but it's something to think about for future years, um, just in terms of things that might help you kind of mitigate some of those drought issues. So some water development, which we talked about last week, um, just providing some shade, maybe cross-fencing a few pastures. And then, like I mentioned, um, preparing your drought plan, a written drought plan, it's not fun, but it's necessary. Um, having some of those trigger dates, and we do have a really good publication on our NDSU Extension website that lists out those trigger dates that are specific to our state. So that's really helpful. Um, your grazing plans, what's your culling list? Um, you've got your your top list of culls, and then if you have to go deeper, that's gonna be a different list. And Lisa, like she said, we'll talk about that more in detail. Um, acting early is always the key during drought. So the sooner that you can decide what you're gonna need and get those feeds in, um, you're likely gonna be able to lock things in, hopefully at a better price, 
and you're not competing with a lot of people that are in the same situation. That last bullet point there, again, maybe this year is not the year to do that. Um, if, you know, it just depends on your financial situation, but it's always good to think about maybe just maintaining a certain portion of our herd. If we're cow-calf focused, maybe we have 20% or 30% of that, um, our total carrying capacity that's um, maybe yearlings or something that's more easily liquidated than cow-calf pairs, um, because we are facing drought nearly every other year truly in our situation. So just something to think about for the long term um, in terms of being able to maybe make those culling decisions a little bit easier. So kind of these are just some strategies um, that we have in terms of managing the cow herd. And I will talk about a few of these things in more detail, but just in general, um, kind of the way to manage our feed needs, um, just reduce the total feed needs. So again, maybe getting rid of some of our livestock on hand, um, trying to reduce the nutrient requirements of the animals that are there. Um, and we'll talk about that in more detail. And then of course, substituting or supplementing our forages. So we'll talk more about culling as we go, um, but usually the old and non-productive cows are kind of gonna be first on that list. Um, second bullet point here, shorten the breeding season, early preg test. So there's kind of a couple different schools of thought here and your strategy is really gonna be specific to your operation. This is just something to think about. Um, a lot of times during drought, if maybe our cows aren't in the best condition, um, people might want to actually lengthen their breeding season to just give more cows an opportunity to get bred. Um, but if you think about going the other way and maybe going to say a 45 day breeding season followed by preg check 35 to 40 days after um, the end of the breeding season, you're, end up, you're gonna end up uh, really reproductively efficient with your cow herd. And again, maybe that helps make some of those culling decisions a little bit easier. Then of course, there's the option of relocating all or a portion of the herd. Um, if you're looking at a portion of them, a lot of times the best thing to do is think about those groups that have really high requirements. So um, growing stock like calves or yearling heifers, um, those would be good ones to think about getting off the ranch versus our mature cows, maybe we early wean and those have the lowest requirements. A um, couple options here, leasing in other locations, moving to a custom feedlot, or maybe you're thinking about investing in some pen space or developing um, a lot on some sacrifice pasture that you could maybe renovate after the drought is done, which is hopefully soon. Just some considerations when you're thinking about moving cows, um, make sure you have a good written signed lease agreement. Very important. Um, we know what happens when that doesn't exist. These are just some of the points of agreement that we need to come to um, thinking about um, are those cattle locked in as far as uh, timing, like beginning and end dates of that lease, or is there an option for maybe bringing some of them back if conditions do happen to change? Um, just things to think about. And then also, of course, who is going to re be responsible for checking cattle, water fences? You wanna get all that laid out ahead of time. Also, if you're working with someone that you're not familiar with, it's a good idea to get some references and check around so you don't end up in a wreck. If your cows are having to go out of state, um, looking at kind of this being a regional issue and, and maybe our neighbor, our closest neighbors are affected as well, really good idea to learn a little bit about the area, the types of forages we have and think about things that maybe we haven't experienced before in our area um, and just how to manage that. And then of course, there's just the actual relocation itself, looking into those health and ID requirements uh, for moving those cows. And then Dr. Stuck will talk a little bit more about biosecurity plans, but it is really important to think about how we re prepare our cattle to leave the home place. Do they need some additional vaccinations? Um, how are we gonna manage quarantine when they come back to the ranch after they've been possibly commingled with other cattle? Okay, so looking at reducing the nutrient requirements of the cows on hand, um, that first one is just I mean, it's fairly simple, um, nothing too mind blowing there, but it's just something that maybe we don't think about um, just in terms of heat stress on those animals in the summer months. Usually um, over 80 degrees would be kind of a moderate heat stress. And then as we get above 90, that's, that's gonna be fairly advanced. So you see um, panting, um, the cows will try to find shade. They're going to bunch up. 
um, change grazing patterns and production can be impacted at that point. So um, giving those cows the ability to find some shade will help lower that core body temperature and reduce the, the overall maintenance needs that they have. Ionophores are something we typically think of in relation to cattle feeding, but we can definitely use them with mature cows, either in a dry lot situation or on pasture. And essentially what those do is just change the efficiency of that rumen environment and make it more efficient. So they're able to maintain body condition on less feed. An added benefit of ionophores is some prevention and control of coccidiosis. So that's a good thing to think about. And they're fairly cost effective. Um, the range kind of depends on how you're including it. Uh, might be mixed into a TMR or included in a supplement or mineral package. And then we will talk a little bit more about early weaning. Um, but when you think about cow requirements, we've got requirements for maintenance. We've got requirements for growth if they are still young cows. And of course, there's a lactation requirement. So the only one that we can really truly control is the lactation requirement. So thinking about extending and utilizing forages to the best of our ability, um, we kind of, uh, the bullets that are in italics here, those are ones we've kind of talked about before, making sure you have a good idea of what you've got on hand. This is where our nutrient analysis is going to be extremely important so that you can use forages efficiently, match those forages up with the production groups um, based on their stage of production, feed the highest quality forage to those groups that have the highest requirements, and then anything you can do to reduce waste, um, processing, feeding one day's feed at a time. There's a lot of different um, hay waste factors that go in there. And we have found that hay waste can be as high as 30 to 40% just based on traditional feeding strategies. So anything you can do to reduce that will definitely be a benefit. Um, Carl Hoppe talked about some of our options for different feedstuffs that we can think about in these diets. So I'm not gonna focus too much on that. And then we, we've also talked about annual forages, crop residues, just maybe thinking out of the box and using things you haven't used in the past. And I will also talk a little bit more about dry lot and creep feeding as ways to extend forages. So when we're thinking about feeding supplement out on pasture, uh, we have a couple different scenarios here. And this is from Clay Mathis. Um, and so he sets up a couple scenarios. The first one is where we have unlimited forage and our crude protein is adequate and our energy is also likely adequate. And so unless those cows are in a low body condition score for some reason, we probably don't need to supplement. So obviously during a drought, this is probably not a scenario you're going to encounter, um, but it's one during a normal production year that we would expect. The second scenario where maybe you've You've managed your grazing, so you have some forage reserves. We're not too worried about supply at this point yet, um, but maybe the, the grass is kind of brown and dry, hasn't been utilized. And so those cows are gonna really benefit from a high protein supplement that's gonna help them utilize the fiber in those dry forages. The third scenario, maybe we're a little bit limited on forage, but crude protein is adequate. And we could use an energy supplement to substitute for some of that limited forage um, the other option is thinking about reducing our stocking rate. Again, always going back to what's going to be our impact on our, on our forage base. And then scenario four, this is kind of our double whammy and one that you might be facing depending on where you're at. Um, we do have limited forage and maybe crude protein is also inadequate. Um, those cows are going to need both because they don't have enough forage to meet their energy requirements and the crude protein is also inadequate. So in this situation, it's often difficult to actually meet requirements through supplementation. Um, it just gets kind of hard to manage in terms of actually getting the feed out there and that, um, and that amount that might be needed. So in that case, we're going to need to consider just getting the cows completely out of the pasture into a dry lot or relocating. So regardless of where you're at, when we think about supplementing, uh, you want to compare not on the cost per ton, but on the cost per pound of the nutrient that you're looking for, whether that's protein or energy or both. And then think about all those other costs that come into play. And there's a lot of tools online that you can use to calculate your total cost per pound of nutrient. So these are just a couple ways, and we've talked about these strategies in the past. Um, I think it's just really important during drought that maybe a little more vigilant about monitoring what the cow condition is like and when what their nutrient status is. And so body condition scoring, 
Um, that's when we talk about all the time, right? And so there's kind of five key times during the year where it's really helpful um, to kind of write down some condition scores. If you're not writing them down, at least kind of subconsciously be assessing what those scores are. So late gestation, a lot of, a lot of cows in the state are in that stage now or into calving. Late gestation is kind of our last opportunity to increase condition before we hit calving. And that body condition score at calving is gonna be one that's really important um, in determining how those cows are going to uh, reproduce the following breeding season. Of course, body condition score at breeding is also important. And it's time to think about what are our, what's our forage situation looking like? Do we need to early wean to move some of those thin cows past their anestra state, get them cycling and get them bred up? And then I guess just based on your typical weaning date, maybe a couple months before that, start again, kind of assessing things. Um, are the cows looking a little bit thin? Do we need to supplement? Do we need to early wean and supplement? It just kind of depends on what things are looking like. And then at weaning, um, we're thinking about, again, this is the point where we're gonna remove that lactation requirement. The cows are gonna be at their lowest point for nutrient requirements. Really good time to add condition. And it's also important to think about what your weaning date is in relation to calving. And so are you go going to give your cows enough time to fully recover um, prior to their next calf being born? Um, so that time point in between weaning and calving is, is gonna be really important, especially in a drought situation where forage is gonna be an issue. I have a couple pictures there. Those are from SDSU Extension. Um, just kind of taking a look at manure consistency is one way to kind of evaluate what the protein situation looks like. If you see distinct rings, we likely have a deficiency. Um, you can see the photo in the middle there it doesn't have a lot of structure. The folds are flatter, not stacked up quite so high. In most cases, this is going to be adequate, but if we're looking at lactating cows, they're gonna need more around 11%. So there's still an opportunity to, to supplement some of those production groups, just depending on when you're calving and when lactation takes place. And then if you see um, that bottom picture, no structure, protein is likely in excess and you don't need to worry about supplementation. So those are just a few things to keep an eye on. Uh, feeding cows in dry lot, um, this is you know, an option that a lot of people have utilized over the years. Um, it can be, it can kind of stretch us in terms of how we think things should be done because most of the time we're gonna be thinking about a limit fed high grain ration. And so we do have a minimum amount of forage that we wanna include there just to maintain rumen function. So typically that's 0.5% of the body weight. Um, obviously considerations with, you know, if you're dry lotting cows on your own place, you've gotta have the right equipment. You need to have adequate bunk space. That's really important, especially if we're limit feeding because there will be a lot of competition. And also thinking about total pen space, do you have the ability to sort out some of those young cows and maybe feed them separately just to kind of eliminate that? Um, recognize that their behavior is gonna be a little different, um, at least those first couple weeks. Some people put out some low quality forage just to kind of provide a little bit more fill um, and keep those cows just a little bit more satisfied. Um, this is a good opportunity to consider ester synchronization programs and AI. If you are using natural service, it's a good idea to kind of um, put, a, put a corner or something where some calves can get out of the way if you, are, if you do have bulls and cows in the same lot with calves. Okay, so thinking about managing those calves, um, we, all, we often talk about creep feeding and early weaning, but they, and, and in many cases, we use them in the same scenarios with limit forage, limited forage availability, uh, but they will kind of result in different benefits. So I just wanted to go through this. So start with creep feeding. Um, if we have maybe a little bit of, of limited forage availability, but, but our cows can still be out on grass, this is just a way to kind of reduce that grazing pressure of the calf. It's not gonna result in a whole lot of changes from the cow. Um, calves will still prefer milk over creep, and they will, but they will also prefer creep over forage. So they're gonna eat more creep feed and a little less forage. Um, we might be looking at maybe our milk production is kind of dropping off, maybe in those couple months before weaning in our younger or older cows. And so maybe there's an opportunity to creep feed um, just a portion of our herd rather than all of them. 
Um, and then just kind of a general rule of thumb, if the price per pound of calf is greater than 10 times the cost per pound of creep, it's usually beneficial to provide that creep. And that's just based on the feed conversion of, of most creeps, and there will be a little bit of variation there. So you can see some of the benefits that I mentioned, decreased forage intake by calves. We usually see an increasing weaning weight. That can vary from 10 to 60 pounds. It just depends on the type of creep, um, intake, all those things. So um, typically 50 pounds would be a good goal. We can get a better uniform calf crop, um, maybe bump up some of those calves whose dams didn't have adequate milk production, like I mentioned in some of those groups above. And then this can also be a really good way to kind of transition some of those calves headed into weaning, get them eating some um, high quality feed, going up to a feeder, learning how to eat of a, out of a bunk. So again, it, it can have a lot of benefits. Uh, you do have to kind of watch and make sure the calves aren't getting too fat, especially when it comes to your heifers or potential replacements. There can be some impacts on reproductive efficiency and milk production later in life if they do get too fat, even during calfhood. And then of course, there's always a risk. Um, maybe they don't gain as much as they should and you just ends up with a lot of increased cost. Um, thinking about early weaning. So any, really early weaning is any time before you would normally wean, um, but typically 45 to around 170 days of age. Um, this will really, the timing will really vary depending on your goals, forage conditions, um, what your cows look like. Um, but again, it's really important to have a good plan in place. Are you going to feed those early wean calves? Are you going to sell light calves? Um, really important to look at your marketing strategy and make sure you're not going to end up in a bind there. Uh, there are a ton of benefits to early weaning. There's been a lot of research done on this strategy. Um, you get forage savings because obviously you, your cow has now, you've taken away that lactation requirement that we talked about. Um, one study that was done between North and South Dakota, um, they weaned spring calving cows. Some were weaned in August and some were weaned in November. And so those calves that were early weaned, um, those mature dams had forage intake about 74% um, percent of what the calves with cows with calves at side had. So about a 25% forage savings there um, from reducing the requirement of that cow. You do see an increase in cow body condition by removing that lactation requirement because that lactation requirement is very high on the priority list. So this is really a quick way to increase body condition in cows. And then depending on when you're doing this, um, you can get those cows starting to cycle. Part of that is by removing that lactation requirement and also breaking that maternal bond with the calf will definitely reduce that anestrous period that occurs in, in uh, post-calving cows. And there's also some research saying um, early wean calves have increased feed efficiency and even, and even tend to have a higher quality grade um, when they're harvested. There's always risks, um, different kinds of market risk. And then of course, a lot of increased management and labor. You've got to make sure those calves can reach the bunk and waterers. Um, your typical pen is not going to allow you to do that depending on the size of the calf and when you're weaning. Um, you also have to make sure you have a lot of high quality feed on hand. Those calves are not going to be able to utilize low quality forages. They have to have a really nutrient dense diet in order to gain efficiently. So those are all things to think about. And Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Janet. Excellent discussion. And I'm going to lead us into culling. And um, in operations that I think have really advance the quality of their cows. Culling is an everyday event. They, they actually have a strategic culling plan in place. And so I ask, what's your culling criteria? And no doubt every operation is different. If you ask Jana what their culling criteria it is at their ranch, she would say something different than Dr. Stuckawood at his ranch and something different than our ranch. And so I, I think it's really important that for your ranch, you identify what your uh, culling criteria are. And before calling above the obvious, set some goals for your operation, um, what you want your cows to be, what you want your operation to be long-term, and then use some records to help you make decisions. And um, on the screen, there's a, a picture of a, a producer's uh, calving buck, and you'll see that there's notes along the side. So they've actually, uh, in this operation, they body condition scores, uh, cows at calving, they give them udder scores, they give them feet scores so that they can make better 
culling decisions and in, in this operation, they actually cull cows out so that they don't get bred and have the opportunity to stick around. And so they make some pretty strong culling decisions. And if you aren't keeping some good production records, calving is the perfect time to start. And in our um, spring calving herds, that's occurring for most of our operations. So reasons to call beyond what I call the three O's, the three O's of old, open, and ornery are shortages of feed, economics, and then what I call traits beyond convenience. I, I don't think any of us are getting any younger and uh, certainly labor is a labor shortages are a situation on our farms and ranches. And so getting cows in to mess with their udders or deal with their feet or whatever the story is, um, today is not a convenience thing. Those are things that take time out of our schedule. And so I have here a scenario of two herds that have the same breed of cattle. They actually are um, neighboring herds. Neither one of them is mine. I just know both of these operations. I actually learned from one of these operations because I noticed annually they always sold heifers for such a high price. And I wanted to know why that was. And uh, so I got to know these operations. And the topper operation in herd one has a very disciplined culling program that started about 30 years ago. Um, because they understood that there was a value to raising replacement quality heifers, but they knew to do that, they needed to have replacement quality cows. And so um, I, they have a strong culling program. They call cows based upon body condition score at weaning. They call cows based upon mature cow weight actually. And they also call cows based upon uh, feet and udder and disposition. And so when we compare these two herds, they calve at relatively the same time. Um, the top herd uh, sold heifers this uh, past November, uh, sold 91 of those six weight, uh, excuse me, 91 six weight steers for about $963 a head. They sold 104 six weight heifers um, for about $990 a head. So in their herd, um, you can see that heifers outsold steers by about $28, $29 a head. And they actually had two or three drafts of steers. I just picked the biggest uh, numbers of draft size uh, numbers sold. In the second herd, they actually sold uh, within five head of the same um, amount of cattle that day. Um, same sale, same breed, a different herd. They sold 85 head of six weight heifers for about $851 a head. And so between these two herds that utilize the same breed have pretty much the same management in terms of feed and range uh, and all those things, there's $111 per head difference, heifers versus heifers. And so why is that? Well, a lot of it is in that second herd, they don't have nearly as strict of a culling uh, program or uh, herd sire selection for that matter is the first herd. And so what it has allowed the first herd to do is to have a lower culling rate and retain more cows. That was pretty good deal for them when replacement heifer calves were selling for $1,500 a head and they had a replacement rate of 5%. They could sell more heifer calves. And so um, in the past year, uh, herd one had a replacement rate of 8.4% and herd two had a replacement rate of 23%. And so it's a long-term strategy to improving profitability, but I also think it gives your herd more resilience as you go into these tougher times. So as we look at culling decisions, the easiest is certainly getting rid of your open cows. Don't skip preg checking. This is not the year to do that. In fact, I would do it earlier rather than later. But after culling your opens, our decisions become more challenging. In my operation, in my herd, and I think probably Dr. Stuckas and Jana's, um, probably the next creatures to go are the ornery ones. And so disposition is a human safety issue. It's a, herit it's a heritable condition. We have decreased profitability. It impacts carcass quality. It impacts rate of gain in feed yards. It impacts conversion. And it's a livestock safety issue and it's an animal health issue. And so you can see in this picture that somebody sold a cow as a third, uh, Third calver turned out to an Angus bull, says wife is scared of the cow, the husband's scared of the wife, the cow has to go. Well, obviously, if everybody's that scared of her, maybe she should have gone a little while ago. And so again, this is a good time at calving. If you got a cow that you can't even get near her calf, maybe now's the time to think about getting rid of her because it's not worth somebody getting hurt. When we look at bad feet, um, you know, we don't really seem to notice our bad footed cattle until they have to really start walking uh, to get water, uh, to 
cover more range, uh, maybe if they're in a, a wet lot situation, if it's a really wet period, but bad feet are a genetic thing, typically. Um, it's in terms of structure, lots of times. We have vertical cracks, like you can see on the left-hand side, uh, corkscrew claws, and long toes. And um, all of those things affect productivity and profitability, and it's a well-being issue. And you know, I never, being raised in the mountains of Colorado where there were rocks everywhere, I never knew cows could have bad feet. When I moved to North Dakota 22 years ago, uh, probably eight out of the 10 first questions I got for several, um, several months was about bad-footed cows, and I could never understand that. And I think it's, more, it's not only a genetic issue, but it's also an environmental issue where you are. And so maybe this is something in your herd you want to work on. Um, is something with structure and bad feet. Along with that, uh, bad udders, this is again, often genetic. I encourage producers to look at the uh, maternal grand dam of sires that they're purchasing to look check out their feet and their udders because lots of times that transfers on to the bull that you're, you're buying to produce your re, uh, future replacements. Um, bad udders equal bad colostrum and that's a calf health issue. We know that those calves that don't get clo uh, good colostrum have a higher chance of being sick. They don't gain as much, they're unprofitable, and they have uh, more disease issues. And if udders drag in the ground, we also have increased incidence of disease. To me, it's a labor and management issue. Um, and it's a, definitely an issue if you have to get that cow in to suck. And you know, I think about um, our operation when I met my husband is, he and his brother might have to get a cow in and his grandpa had a pretty short-term memory. And his brother, my husband and his brother say, don't you think we should call that cow? Oh my gosh, look at the calf she weaned off. Well, yeah, but you didn't have to mess with her at calving time. So again, mark that out in your records. She's a good candidate to go down the road. And then our thins, especially when in comparison to other cows of their um, same age and same type, uh, cows in a uh, poor body condition score, they have a tougher time rebreeding. It's going to take more nutrition to get them back into shape. We would like to see our uh, heifers, at least in a body condition score of six at calving time. And I think all of us would agree that we'd like to see our cows pushing six to seven at calving time as well. Now, late breads, Jana talked a little bit about this. But depending on uh, your days that your cows have been exposed to a bull, late calvers, uh, we know that calves are born in the first 21 days, and that would be the first cycle, as we would call it, or more profitable off the cow in the feed yard and on the rail in the packing plant. They offer more weaning weight than their contemporaries. Uh, the replacement heifers tend to be more, product, more productive and have more longevity in a herd, and a higher percentage of cows will calve back in that first cycle. So if you have a lot of late breads in your herd this year, if you've been fighting some late breads and opens, I think it's a good time to ask yourself, is your system feed, fitting your environment? Why are we having these late bred cows? Why are we having a higher percentage of opens? Is it because we've gotten ourselves into a situation of high milk in our genetics? Um, are they not able to fit in really well uh, in a drought situation or limited forage? What's that look like? And so. I will also ask if we have another wet spring, and yes, it will rain someday, um, do you wanna be dealing with planting and calving at the same time? And I can't answer that for you, but for our operations that are very much integrated livestock and crop, that might be a, a good question to ask. So some strategies for tightening up your calving, Jana talked about synchronizing and AIing. And, you know, sometimes for some of our operations, we don't have the manpower to do that. We don't have the knowledge to do that. And so we can also um, utilize uh, synchronization in a natural breeding situation with a bull. And so we can increase the number of females that are pregnant in that first 30 days. We can get similar pregnancy rates in that first cycle uh, as you would to AI sync. Uh, in some of our protocols, you can actually induce cycling in cows that aren't cycling, uh, and that's particular in, in our cedar protocols. And it'll give the majority of our cow herds more opportunity to be bred in the first 90 days of the calving season. And so if that's something that you're really interested in, talk to your local county extension agent. Um, they have these resources, we have these resources, and we can help you out with that. Um, those protocols can be effective um, 
we effectively use to tighten our calving seasons, but you really need to plan. This is not something that you decide to do today when you normally turn your bulls out tomorrow. You need to have some back planning. Uh, our conception will be improved if our, if our females are in the correct body conditions, six to seven in cycling. However, again, if they're not, sometimes our cedar protocols can help that conception. Um, the economic value to all this is having more calves born in a shorter calving season. We can go through and look at our broken mouth cows. I think we, we tend to think that our older cows have worse mouths than our younger cows. That's not always true. And so it's a good reason to mouth your cows, especially if you're in a tight forage situation. Um, because if those cows don't have any teeth left, there's no sense in turning them out on forage that's pretty minimal. Um, so, you know, we can mouth them for that soundness. Um, we can do this at the same time that we're doing our feet and, leg, leg, feet and legs and udder criteria. Um, and we know that typically a cow has to be seven to eight years old before she becomes an income instead of a, an expense. And then finally, and probably if it was in my operation near the top of the list, poor producers. Um, but we have to have those records to identify those cows. And so unless a cow has a good reason that she hasn't raised a decent calf, let her go to work for somebody else. Um, everybody has to earn their keep. And then finally, don't forget the bulls in your operation. You know, I, I think sometimes after we've pulled bulls, we tend to forget about them until we have to turn them out. But make sure all your bulls are going to pass a breeding soundness exam. There's no reason to run a bull that's not gonna get a cow bred or doesn't have a high probability of getting a cow bred or a bull that has bad feet or whatever the story is. So apply similar culling criteria to your bull battery. And if you're planning on culling your bulls, I'd encourage you to do that sooner rather than later. Um, I certainly know that we can't cull our entire herd. If we don't think our cows have good enough udders, we can't cull them all. But I establish some criteria and start working on that. It's always a work in progress. And so with that, Dr. Stuck is going to talk to us about drought in our health systems and uh, considerations for managing your cows. Very good, very good. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, I was thinking about what Lisa was talking about, mouthing cows and looking in their mouth. And, and, and so I used to work at an auction, livestock auction, where I had to mouth cows. It's a funny thing, cows never appreciate going to the dentist. <laughs> They don't appreciate the fact of what you're trying to do for them. So if you're going to mouth cows, maybe you need to do it at preg check time, have your veterinarian help you mouth some cows. You at least have a squeeze shoot with a head bender or some way to control that head because they they just don't appreciate it at all, Lisa. You so, <laughs> yeah. So let's just talk a little bit about growth and, and health. And, and uh, you know, going back to something that Jana said about biosecurity, and sending your cows to different places. One of the things I, one of the things I probably need to mention: the further south you go, there are some diseases that can show up when you bring them back. So, for example, some of the the blood sucking insects that exist in other parts of the country that don't exist here because of our wonderful winters. Things like anaplasmosis, for example, even blue tongue to to some extent. But anaplasmosis is one of those things that actually can be transferred with a blood sucking insect. When you bring it back to your to North Dakota, you almost you may have anaplasmosis show up. And anaplasmosis is a disease that infects the red blood cells. So you get tremendous hemolysis of red blood cells and a cow becomes anemic. And so it's a nasty thing. So it's important to think about where you're sending those cows, what might come back that I didn't have in the first place. And so all those things that need to enter in your, in your thinking when you're sending cows into a different area. One of the things though I thought about this drought, it compounds so many things. It, everything becomes a little worse. I mean, we, Jana talked about nutrition stress. Miranda last week talked about water quality and quantity stress. Then we get into heat stress. That leads to other things as well. And, and finally, I'll just finish up a little bit with some internal parasite stress that we don't tend to think about as much in, in the Northern Plains. So all of these pictures, I think I took the same year and, and it, may be, it may have been 2006, I'm not sure, but all of these were in North Dakota. And one of the things I'm trying to illustrate on that image on the left-hand side of the screen is that 
no matter what you're growing, whether it's forage or cash crops, you've got reduced grazing and feed resources. So it's not, it doesn't impact just the native pasture you're on, but it impacts the other feed resources you were counting on. Uh, the, the image on the, on the right just talks about heat stress. And I don't know if you can see it real well there, but I'm trying to portray that these cat, cattle here are trying to seek shade in a pasture that doesn't have a whole lot of shade. And then there's some water close by and it, that brings up a set of issues <laughs> that almost makes things worse. So I got heat stress, I'm trying to find shade. I don't have very good water. The cattle are bunching up. Now I get more fly pressure. Now I got greater transmission of things like pink eye, and even for that matter, sometimes respiratory organisms, and even foot rot cases. So it's, as I said when I started, it, it, it compounds everything else that in a normal year of average rainfall, you may not see some of these things show up. As we talked about last week, water quality and quantity are, are, are impact. They not only impact health, and there's some severe issues that can run that we can get into with water quality. For example, we talked last week, Miranda and I, about blue-green algae blooms and high sulfate waters and the things that can result from that. But not having enough water to drink and good quality impacts forage intake as well. They won't eat as much. On, on the right-hand side of this, it has an impact, of course, when they're not eating enough on body condition score calf weaning weight and, and potentially even immune status. And sometimes that relates to that middle picture that because of lack of forage and if we haven't supplemented or we haven't moved these cattle, cows and calves graze closer to the ground and, and closer to manure patties. And when they do all of these things, when they congregate in these moisture areas, you increase your stocking density compared to what you think you were doing. They graze down to the roots and then what happens is they actually get exposed to more parasites than they would under normal conditions. And so you've increased the worm burdens. They're eating uh, grass that's close to the manure, manure patties. And one of the things, there's two things that happens with internal parasites. Internal parasites suppress the appetite. It's not like the parasites are actually stealing nutrients from the cow, that's not the case they actually suppress the appetite of animals that are parasitized, which compounds things even further. And then the other part of internal parasites is that it has a negative impact on the immune response. So if I'm, for example, let's say I'm even early weaning and I've got pastures that look like this carpet in this room or that image on the right, I'm probably gonna have a little greater impact or greater parasite burden and so now I got to think about is my vaccines that I'm going to administer, will it have the same immune response if those calves were less parasitized? So that, that's the issue of drought, of drought of parasites. And it's the issue of all of these things tending to compound one of, the, one of the, uh, each other and, and really resulting in things that we see that in a normal year we wouldn't. Just a couple comments on, on heat stress. I know you probably can't see that image as well as you'd like in the middle, but that's that old famous temperature humidity chart. And I've actually borrowed this from, from the University of Nebraska. And anything in the red there indicates that there's a great deal of potential stress on those animals. And, the, and then you go to gold and yellow and it's less stress. And it's difficult at times to ameliorate heat stress. Shade is beautiful. The, the windbreaks that we created for winter feeding become a problem because now we're not getting wind speed that it kind of ameliorates some of this heat and humidity. Uh, you know, so, and, if, and we, a number of years ago, we even had animals out on pasture that were suffering from severe heat stress. So it, can ha it most often happens in confinement, but it can happen out on pasture as well. And that's where you gotta be mindful of uh, having providing enough water, enough water space to drink. And the other th thing is, think about when you're gonna handle cattle, whether it's in the feedlot or whether you're early weaning and you're doing it out on pasture, let's say, think about when you handle these cattle and how you're processing them. If you're gonna go into a time where there's too much heat stress, don't do it. Just plan for another day. If on the other hand, you're kind of constrained by time and help, and you're gonna process, make sure you do it early in the morning 
to at least take advantage of some of those cooler mornings that we get into. By the way, that ca calf on the left on that image, that's, I will tell you that's not a North Dakota calf in case you hadn't figured that out already. Those are animals that, that, holler, that tolerate heat stress much better than our, our English and continental breeds do. You know, maybe just a final comment and maybe I'll turn it over to either Jana or maybe Lisa to just sum up, but this is a, a slide that Lisa and I actually, she put the brochures together about stop the truck, but the, the message here is that you and I have a stewardship responsibility to the, the animals and the land that they run on. And so this isn't just about managing through a drought. This is about managing the resources that we have responsibility for. And I, I thought this, this one is such a good one. You know, anytime cattle leave our place, we need, to know, we need to know not only who they are, but are they healthy leaving our place? And are they healthy coming back? Or if they're going to slaughter, are they healthy for the people that will consume the, the products of beef cattle? So I, I thought this was a good one to end on. It's always a stewardship responsibility, whether we're in a drought or whether we're in a normal year. So maybe Lisa, you just want to sum up a little bit or Jana, do you want to sum up a little bit about all the things we talked about? So in our session today, we talked about um, some strategies for utilizing your nutritional resources the best. So whether that means that you're gonna minimize the numbers of head that you have on those resources, whether you're going to supplement, how you're going to manage that, then gave you some strategies um, for culling beyond your olds, opens and, and onries, the, the three O's. And then finally, uh, talking about some animal health situations that we need to be aware of as we move into these and certainly not um, skimping on our, our parasite control in a year of drought. So again, with uh, thank you, we'll answer some questions if there are any. So first one is for Jana. Um, so energy requirements and protein requirements, you talked about both. Um, how does the timing of drought influence which one would be appropriate or which supplement may be needed? Probably going to be a, a timing and a duration of drought issue. And it's actually really difficult to characterize what's going to happen with forage quality. It's going to be really variable depending on the species that you have, previous grazing management, all those factors that go into that. Um, in some years, um, if the drought is fairly moderate, we can see that as long as there's adequate forage available, we can see cattle perform fairly well because some of those grasses tend to concentrate nutrients and they're actually fairly high in protein and energy, maybe, maybe, more, maybe higher in energy than protein if they're, if they're still kind of brown and dried out. But um, we can see calf weaning weights you know, fairly high, maybe higher than we might see in a normal year. But again, it's just so variable. Um, it's kind of looking at, you know, typically if the grasses are brown, um, you're gonna be in a protein deficient state. Um, if forage quantity is the factor, we're gonna be looking at an energy deficiency. And then in some cases, we're gonna need both. And so I know that you know, sampling standing forage is, is not a typical strategy, but in some cases that might be really the best way to kind of assess what's going on and the only way to really get a very specific number about what you're dealing with. Um, Lisa, you, you visited quite a bit about body condition scoring. Do you have any recommended resources for the folks um, that are on in terms of guides for body condition scoring? Sure, Miranda, and thank you. Uh, so we have several resources available. Um, I think at least Jenna and mine, our favorite would happen to be a body condition uh, publication from the University of Wyoming. Uh, we think that that's the easiest for producers to understand. We've also talked about body condition scoring in several of our previous webinars, and um, those are available on our NDSU website as well. I'd also encourage you to talk to your local county extension agents along with your veterinarians. Get another set of eyes on those cattle because when you see cattle every single day, you don't see the changes that occur within your herd. And we see that day in and day out. And so um, talk to your county extension agent, talk to your local veterinarian. Um, they can help you with those resources as well. 
Thank you, Lisa. And we'll try to get the find that link for that for that publication, put that in the chat box for you guys. So Dr. Stucky, you touched a little bit on some health concerns. Um, what are the, some other, are there any immediate other ones we should be thinking about as we're starting into this, this freezing season, knowing that we're drier this year and, and the forecast isn't looking fair, favorable. Um, so are there any other things that people should have in their mind? I know we, which this is a little ways off, but potentially, but we hear a lot of cases of dust pneumonia potentially during drought. Um, is that something people need to be thinking about now um, or? So yeah, we talk about, this is another one of these compounding issues. So let's say I'm on a pasture rotation, it gets really dry and I got to move cattle two or three miles and then we're obviously going to walk them to the next pasture. And what happens is the cows usually lead and the calves get strung out behind. So they're following in all that dust. And it's always hard to prove that dust pneumonia is real, but I think what it does, it sets up the conditions for a calf to be more susceptible. So if I'm, if I'm standing and walking, walking a long distance, I'm a little bit exhausted as a calf, I'm trying to put myself in that situation. Now I'm breathing all that dust. So now I'm overwhelming some of these natural defense mechanisms that keep me healthy. And so it, it, it does make sense that when we do that and we're doing it for the right reasons, but we may end up with a greater risk of, for example, respiratory disease. And so, so what do you do about that? You still have to move the cattle. I'd say move them slowly, move them early in the morning, maybe when there's a little dew out there at least, and then be very watchful of things happening. And this, this requires a lot of commitment because in these bigger pasture, it takes a long time to, to find every animal. But when an animal's off by itself or you see the mother and you don't see the calf, you see the mother and she's got a full bag. I mean, those are <laughs> little sentinel cases that you better start looking and see what's going on. And, and sometimes, unfortunately, the first thing you find is a dead calf or one with its ears down and it's got a rectal temperature of 107. And it's usually due to to respiratory disease. So yeah, that's that's one of those things that we need to be mindful of when we're moving cattle long distance in the heat of the day, uh, dusty conditions, it, it just can compromise the health of those calves, that's for sure. Thank you, Dr. Stucka. Um, one more we have here is, and it's probably maybe for both Jana and Jerry is, you know, what are your thoughts? Um, and we touched on it a little bit, but not we didn't go into a lot of great detail. Is the, um, the versus the health and maybe just the economics even of having cows out on pasture in a year like this versus moving them to a dry lot situation? Here's the I guess the big thing overall. Whenever I put cattle into confined space. The first thing that happens to cattle that haven't been in a confined space is they actually develop a little confinement anxiety. And then if you start sorting those pairs or their calves and there's, there's uh, anxiety from not being with the rest of the group. But what happens is when you put cattle in a smaller space is that, and they're a little bit stressed from changing to a new diet and changing to, to a new environment that um, the transmission of some of these pathogens, whether it's viral or bacterial, is increased a great deal. The other thing that you'll notice too in confinement operations, it's not just the things we can't see like bacteria and viruses, but now you've got other vectors or fomites, if you will, like starlings that start presenting a problem. So now you got contaminated feed and maybe it's the feed that's in the feed bay someplace that that are, it's not very secure, but or maybe it's just a feed in the bunk that now there's starling droppings on them and things like that. So there's a lot of issues that crop up when you decide to dry lot. And yet having said that, sometimes that's the only solution that there is. One, one interesting story I, I thought I'd relate to you is that one of the feed yards in Southwest Kansas decided to, to not feed cattle down there, in other words, feedlot cattle, but to turn it into a cow-calf operation. And I think that lasted one or two years. And the reason, the biggest reason that they stopped doing it was because of disease pressure. You got a young population of 
animals, the newborn calves, for example, um, that have a difficult time handling that much exposure when you're confined in a, in a lot situation. So, I mean, that's the biggest reason that we put cow, that we kind of calve and sometimes, and put cows on a native range. It spreads them out and, and lets, them, lets them live a life that's a little more natural to them. One other interesting tidbit, and this is related to animal behavior, is that they turned the heifer calves that were yearling heifer calves out on, on uh, irrigated quarter sections, and the calves didn't know how to eat grass. They had only eaten from a bunk their entire life, and it took them about three days to figure out that they didn't have to follow the wheel track that looked like a bunk, but they could actually eat the feed that was growing in the in the uh, irrigated pasture. So cattle are, are subject, just like we are, to the environmental influence that they grew up in. And so being confined, unless you're a feedlot animal, is a little bit unnatural for the cow-calf operation. So I, I'm gonna start with my disclaimer that I am definitely not an economist. So those people are really good contacts and resources to have, but it, it kind of depends on the year, right? What our commodity prices are doing. Most of the time, forage is going to be your highest in terms of cost per pound of nutrient um, year in and year out. But you have to look at what grain prices and co-product prices are doing. Um, but typically a dry lot situation um, will allow a little bit of cost savings just because the diet ingredients are more nutrient dense and we're limit feeding. So they're not getting as much as, you know, they're not eating to full capacity. So a cow that might eat 30 pounds of dry matter out on forage is going to maybe get 18 to 22 pounds in a dry lot. And so typically, as far as the economics go, it should result in some cost savings. But again, there's a lot of tools out there um, to kind of help you analyze, you know, do a partial budget and make those comparisons. And it really depends on, you know, the stored feed that you have on hand, how far you have to go to get to a dry lot, um, and just a lot of those different variables. Now let me jump in here a little bit too. Just think about a ration that's $100 a ton, that's five cents a pound. And a cow, let's, if she eats 30 pounds, that's $1.50 a day. And, and there's always a yardage feed and there's a little more markup on feed. I mean, it's, I don't know how you'd feed a cow for less than $2 a day. It's more probably, it's probably going to be more than that. So it, it's a good idea to have some of those numbers in mind. And if you're going to a custom feed yard, I mean, they, they need to tell you what it's going to cost to feed this cow on a daily basis, including everything. Uh, so it's really important to have that in mind. But sometimes that is the best solution. Either that or you sell cows. The unfortunate part of it is if you're selling cows in a drought, the market's not very good either, especially if it's nationwide. If it's just an isolated area, then there are other places that will take some of those cows. A lot of things to think about. This, this thing is a pretty complicated system, and one decision affects so many others. Thank you. Um, so I think we're, we're wrapped up with questions. Why don't we go around to all of our panelists? We can start with Lisa and just some summarizing thoughts, so take home thoughts for folks. I think, you know, um, I would tell you to always be planning for a drought in your operation. I, the only place in North Dakota that I think hasn't seen continual drought, you know, on a pretty regular basis. So, you know, every other year, every two or three years is probably the Red River Valley. And, you know, even to them, they've probably seen drought to the rest of us who live west of them that we don't see it that way. And so start now on planning continually for drought. I think all of us would probably agree. I can't speak for Dr. Stuck and Jana, but the operations that seem to weather these events the best always plan for drought. And so whether that means that they carry over hay some extra years, whether they coal extra hard, you know, they've built some resiliency into their operations um, to get through these tougher drought and dry years. And so I would think, I guess my encouragement is, is to start doing that today and then always do it, just don't do it when it's kind of dry um, because it gives you so much more flexibility in your operation. Um, and you know, I, I live by the motto that you plan for the worst and hope for the best. And 
um, I, I would encourage folks to do that. You know, it will rain someday. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And um, those will be glorious days, but we have to plan for the ones that might not be that great. You know, some of the things that are talked about, I think one of the hardest things to adjust to is doing things that you haven't done before. And early weaning calves, I mean, if you look at the dairy industry, they don't uh, keep calves on milk or place or whole milk very long. So that rumen does start to develop and you can wean calves at a really early, early age. For most of us, it goes against our, goes against our nature, um, but it can be done and, and one of, and you, you're going to have to prepare your facilities if you want to wean really at a really young age because your fences won't be built right, your bunks are too high, uh, you're going to have to change a lot of things. But under conditions where you're out of feed, sometimes you have to do those things and you will be amazed, I think, at once you set your mind to it, that you can actually get it done. Maybe just one other thing related to... Uh, you know, Lisa to use the term resilience, and I like that term. Um, sometimes you have to have resilience built in your cow herd too. That, and that means some genetic resilience, not just nutritional resilience, because the two go together actually, but what can she stand? Or, or have you built a cow herd that's kind of a 426 Hemi Cuda Plymouth, you know, that has to have high octane fuel every day of its life? Or have you got a cow herd that's a little bit more moderate and, and a little bit more resilient that can run on 85 ethanol? And so think about those things because North Dakota does not have the same weather from year to year. And having a little resilience will allow you to be to stay in this business longer. And, and uh, so it's, it's, it's almost a philosophical shift in some of our mindsets in order as we think about this drought and how can we get through it. So. If I can say something about early weaning, um, our operation early weaned in 2006, not because of a lack of forage, but because we had lost our whole place to fire. And uh, I was talking to Dr. Stucka and Jana yesterday that it was amazing how great those cows were that had come out of that early weaning situation and how long they lasted in our herds. And so my short side of this is, yeah, maybe it takes a little work, but I think that there's some benefits to it as well. And if you're in the spot that you need to early wean, we have resources with NDSU and there are producers in North Dakota who have done this before that we can help you with that. And so don't be scared of it. Um, look at that as an option. If it's something you think it might work for you, let us help you out with that. No, you guys have done a great job of kind of wrapping things up. I guess, you know, just looking back in the last couple of weeks and, and all of the topics that have been covered, I mean, this is a complex situation and it's, it's not a fun situation. And, and we, I hate that we even have to talk about this, but we, we are talking about it early to hopefully kind of stimulate some of these processes moving forward and giving you guys time to create some strategies so that you're not in a bind when this thing does hit um, because it does look like it's going to. So getting those written plans written down, um, looking at the different resources that are out there, um, not only from, you know, within our extension system, but other ones as well. Um, and then just, you know, thinking of how some of these strategies, you know, you could maybe tweak a little bit um, and just use on a portion of your herd or combine them with something else. And I think it's always really valuable to talk to each other, talk to your neighbors and, um, if, if any of you guys have unique strategies that you've utilized over the years, we'd all love to hear about them because you can always learn a lot from each other too. You guys are in the trenches and a lot of you have been doing, dealing with these things for a lot of years. And, and so reach out to each other. Um, don't be afraid to seek help is what I guess I'd say. Exactly. Yep. Thank you for those final thoughts. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. The Today's webinar and all our webinars have been recorded and are available on our on the NDSU Extension Drought website. Next week's our last webinar. We are going to be talking about one of the most important resources on your farm and ranch, which is yourself and, the, and how we can handle stress through these type of situations. So please join us for that discussion. Mm -hmm.